anyway, uh, so Bridget will speak on topics of uh, tumor uh, modeling, and, and she gave a nice talk, I think it was two years ago at the main MSM meeting, and uh, so certainly been looking forward to hearing the progress that uh, you've made in the period since. So one of the things you should notice uh, right away from this uh, image on your right is that um, is the cartoon of the organization of the peritoneum, where you can see that the, the peritoneal chamber has uh, contains your intestines, uh, a lot of organs that are in this very specialized environment, and it, it that makes it a really unique microenvironment for the for the tumor. Um, this particular disease, ovarian cancer, has a very high mortality rate. Typically, it's recognized at advanced stage of disease when the, 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 uh, there's already dissemination from the primary into the secondary sites within the peritoneum. And often stays right in the peritoneum. Um, and then what happens is this, um, at this stage, the surgeon goes in, takes out all the, the gross tumor that they can find, and um, they have chemotherapy session. And the relapse situation is when the chemoresistant cells emerge, left behind in this peritoneal chamber. Um, and so our model is a, a model solely of relapse. So at this stage, when the primary tumor has, um, has been removed, and the relapse is from these cells that are left behind. And one of the things you want to think about is really the, the idea that there are multiple therapy routes for, this, for the oncologist. Uh, it can be oral, it can be intravenous, or actually direct injection into the peritoneal chamber. And there's a very unique um, sort of passive flow pattern inside the, the peritoneal chamber. And the peritoneal chamber also transmits fluids from the surround, from from the blood and across the the uh, peritoneal barrier, and so in fact patients can undergo dialysis from the peritoneum. So there's an there's a there's an exchange of materials uh, in and out of the bloodstream. So okay, the initial steps in this relapse process would be that this that these left behind cells. Um, form small spheroids, and then they adhere to the mesothelial layer that surrounds all of the organs. So there's this very, very thin layer um, and covers all of the organs, covers the peritoneal surface. And the, and the ovarian cells then sit down on this layer, and they can then penetrate the layer and begin their uh, extravasation process. But what we focused on is, so that's the putative steps, but what, what would be next? And so our strategy was to try to observe this process. And so we uh, prepared ovarian cancer cells. We, we've used mostly an SKBO3 IP or immuno, uh, uh, interperitoneal injection model. And we make those cells uh, red or green fluorescent uh, by expressing cytoplasmic versions of red or green, or, or green fluorescent protein or red fluorescent protein. Um, we inject around a half a million cells or so, uh, five million cells or so into an immunodeficient athomic nude mouse. And then the next uh, image you can now see what the mice look like at about three weeks after engraftment. So this disease progresses quite rapidly when we introduce only five million cells. And uh, so you can see also the advantage of the fact that they're fluorescent. So uh, I'm, I should, you should be seeing my cursor now over this uh, mass of tumor, but you can also see other small tumors that have disseminated. This, uh, my cursor is now over the spleen where you can see this very dotty pattern, and then now my cursor is over the mesentery, which is a, a webby uh, structure that connects arms of the intestine and the gut. And you can see that there are many small invasive tumors in this uh, mesentery. So what the first question we asked was, um, we wondered why there was such different morphology when the tumors landed in these various sites. Because early on when we were beginning to develop the model, we weren't, we weren't really aware that, um, and the field perhaps was not as aware that every place that the tumors land, they have the ch opportunity to take on a different shape. And so you can see here in this 
mesentery, this web that switch that between the small intestine, you can see this, here's a small tumor. Here's this invasive uh, sort of sponge-like penetration of the spleen. And then here's a, a very a large tumor that's um, grown out into the peritoneal space. And you can see this is a very large tumor. This is only three weeks growth, and it's, very, it's fully vascularized. So we wondered, why are some sites successful, and why is the morphology so different? So we backed up by looking in, that, in, in just earlier than three weeks. So we took images at just four days after we injected. And you can see here that here's a small group of uh, cells. And you can see, if you look on the right, you can see this is the environment those cells are, are residing in, right next to this mesentery vessel. And then the merged image is present. And so you can see there's a, a clump of cells that have made their way up next to a vessel. And so they've managed to penetrate this very thin lining around this, the mesentery, and they've migrated through this, this sort of gray-looking tissue, which is a fatty layer um, in the mesentery. And um, another thing that we, so that was all part of our trying to figure out how early and what was the early behavior of the tumor cells. And the next thing is, how does one think about the, the, um, the characteristics of the tumor itself? Does it prefer to disseminate a single cell? Does it disseminate a spheroid? And what, if that's the case, um, you need to know uh, quite a lot about its adhesion characteristics. And so one of the things, the experiments that we did is we injected a suspension of red cells and green cells. And what we found, what we noticed, you can see the cursor here. Here's a tumor that's grown. It's essentially equally red and green, uh, orange and green. <clears throat> and down below it is if we, um, is the case where we injected red cells. We waited a few days and then we injected green suspension cells. And the first, what you notice is in both cases we have these chimeric tumors. And in the close-up you can see this, how this tumor has grown. You can see quite a mix of red and green fluorescent cells. And you can even see the blood vessel that's penetrating the tumor. So that tells us that the predominant feature of this tumor is self-adhesion. It really binds very strongly to cell. And that's important because the cellular POX model is really a, a little bit of an, a phenomenological model. It, um, but it, what it, it, the advantage is the cellular POX model, maybe there are some cellular POX aficionados out there in the online watching this at the moment. But the, it, for those who don't know much about the cellular POTS model, it is, um, it has some advantages for things like modeling tumor growth and other things that involve cell shape changes and cell motility changes because it has sort of a moving boundary capability. Um, and that's, so that's really critical. And in order to have the tumor, um, each cell in the tumor behave itself, you can see here there's a, a little diagram of four different colored cells in this grid. You have to, the, the most, one of the critical parameters is this adhesion factor. And then you can also see the other parameters that are built into the, the, the model. Um, chemotactic factor diffusion, oxygen consumption, uh, cell radius, um, factors for in extracellular matrix, and so forth. And in fact, um, published in our new paper in uh, Frontiers in Oncology, um, are, are the, the reviewers asked, actually, asked, asked for this, and I'm glad that they did. They asked for the parameters in a cellular POTS framework, and this, this was uh, performed in CompuCell 3D, which is open source uh, um, software developed by Jim Glazier and his colleagues. Um, so this is, if one wanted to start with our model, you could begin with these parameters in the cellular POTS framework. So we think that people should be able to take our model and, um, and go from there to ask different questions than the questions we're asking now. And uh, also in, uh, in the paper is, this, is a table that shows how we explored these adhesion parameters so that hopefully someone who would like to take off 
with the model at this point won't repeat this very laborious uh, process of determining wh which adhesive char characteristics will, for example, keep the cell from the cells from fragmenting during their growth and expansion and motion. And you, you, what you want here is something that down where my cursor is that approximates both the shape um, of the spheroids at a certain period of time and the ability here for them to penetrate this mesothelial labor, layer that they can lay down on. Any questions at this point? Uh, this and, is purely so, two uh, space dimension or 3D, please? This is 3D. And now, uh, how often I do uh, I'm sorry? How many cells can you manipulate in a realistic way on a computer system? So CompuCell 3D has some limitations in terms of the size of this cube that you're seeing here. So the number of pixels, um, in this case, we each cell is occupying a, a, a volume of pixels, but your, your smallest unit is a pixel. So for instance, when we want to look at motion of movement of let's say drugs with interstitial spaces between the cells, we have to work with a much smaller cell framework because our the sort of smallest unit is is this one pixel uh, limitation. So if we want a 10 nanometer space or 100 nanometer space between cells to look at interstitial uh, trans the transport between cells, um, now our we can we have to we're limited in the number of cells we can consider. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Surely. Is the overall framework uh, agent based or kinetic or uh, perhaps uh, force fields through some kind of finite element? So um, you can overlay, so the, the CompuCell 3D, so I rely a lot on my modeling partners to really, I wish one of them was present to, do, to talk to about this, but basically you can have a series of, you, you can overlay upon this, the grid of it, um, things like transport reactions. So it has a lot of flexibility. So essentially the, the, uh, it's an agent-based model upon, over which you overlay other capabilities. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So one of the things we had questions about is that as we began to build the model, we realized for me, as a biologist, this is one of the most interesting features, is that as you begin to try to parameterize the model, you, you really hone in on what you don't know about the system. And what we didn't understand about the system is how was it that a spheroid of cells could penetrate so quickly, let's say, into that mesentery, uh, where, uh, what, what was it about the architecture that would permit this to happen? And so I, we used some electron microscopy methods, so we're looking here at um, a a small, we're looking at two cells here, one, well, no, one, two, three, four cells. You can see the cell boundary here for this one cell, which is has a lot of fat droplets in it. And you can see this very, very thin mesothelial lining that's on the outside of this uh, omental tissue, which is a fatty tissue and similar to the mesentery tissue. And the omentum in this disease is a, is a fatty tissue inside your abdomen that just fills up with a, uh, uh, in a woman's, uh, in, in women who have ovarian cancer. And so we all wondered why is it that they, that this is so permissive? And part of it is that this mesothelial line, lining is exquisitely thin. It's only about a half of a micron th uh, thick, which is, you think of an immune cell, which is a pretty small cell, maybe 10 microns across. So this is really thin. It's a twentieth of that, and um, and and also is this open architecture. So as the cells invade, they do really don't in, they don't really have to pass through any barriers. So we can simulate this process. You can look here. Here's you can simulate the the process of the spheroid binding um, to the to the <laughs> to the uh, mesothelial lining. And then you can imagine that it, you can see that it, as it passes through this open architecture of the fat layer and finds its way next to a vessel where there's a source of oxygen. And in the cell, in the CompuCell 3D framework, you can see this, watch this simulation either in 2D on the left or in 3D 
on the right where the fat cells have been omitted for, for you to be able to see the, the whole thing. And so well, one of the things we know we were curious about is that um, why were the spheroids, why would the cells migrate so close to vessels? And so we, we, we looked in the literature and we know that fat cells secrete IL-8, which is a chemotactic factor for the tumor cells. And of course, if you put in an IL-8 gradient from the fat cells, what happens is that it'll just, it'll penetrate into the, the fat layer and then just stay in the middle. And so that suggests to us a factor that, that there must be something attractive about the vessels. And only if you add um, a chemotactic gradient from both the vessel here in red and the fat in gray, do you get um, do you get migration through the fat layer and next to the vessel? So we think that suggests that there's a factor that we need to look for in vessels that would drive their mo motion through the fat layer. Now and we I get back to this idea of of, um, of morphology. Why do things look so different if they're not in this fatty layer? So we took an, another look at by electron microscopy at the gut here. Now you can see, I hope you can see with my cursor, there's a, a my, there's a, a mesothelial layer. It's a little bit thicker, maybe up to, maybe all the way up to a micron here, um, lining on the outside lining, facing the perineum of the gut. Here's a lot of collagen, and then here, stacked right underneath, there's a lot of smooth muscle. And you can see there's essentially no open space between these smooth muscle cells. And so this seems to be the best explanation why the tumor, when it gets past this mesothelial layer, meets up with all this extracellular matrix and smooth muscle, and really, it's not a very penetrating or metastasizing tumor. It's, it will then just attach, and because there are little blood vessels right here underneath, there's an oxygen supply and a source for, for angi new, new angiogenesis. In fact, we can take a look right at the border between the tumor and uh, the host tissue, and you can see that this vest, large vessel has grown right into the tumor. And what we notice is that even extremely small tumors are fully vascularized. And when we ran simulations, so you can see this little tumor right here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, less than 20 cells across. So if you count just the nuclei, and you can see that this little tumor is fully vascularized, like many tumors that has sort of odd uh, vessels, but they're packed with red blood cells. And so it was struck us that even these little tiny tumors could be vascularized. And so we, a so we asked um, whether or not they would be hypoxic in the center. And uh, so it, you take, it, it takes a, a tumor of over 75,000 cells to even begin to have a hint of hypoxia in the center. So um, the next question really is, is what does the vessel density look like in the tumor? So we excised the tumors and we ran, uh, we performed a stereology approach to measure vessel density in the tumors that grew in, the human tumors that grew in mice, so the, the xenograft tumors. And uh, this unbiased sampling frame allows us to sample across a large section and sort of remove your bias. Um, that you might that you might like to pick this area because it looks nice, or this area because it looks nice. And what was remarkable is that the one we called tumor and the three we called tumors had almost essentially identical vessel length densities. And in fact, we also took a lot of a look at a lot of the vas. We look at all the tumors that we excised, and we found that a very large fraction of the vascularized tumors were below, below the hypoxic threshold that was suggested um, from the mathematical modeling. And so indeed, we, that led us to take a look at what angiogenic factors this very aggressive line would make. And so they all, it, it, that, this suggested that they must be making angiogenic factors extremely quickly, even before they get hypoxic. And indeed, we can see that they make angiogenic factors in even when they are um, in culture, so that uh, so they're already making I8 and Ang2 and Temp1 and Temp2, and, but they do increase some of these factors from two to four hundredfold after you implant them in mice. So it is an evolving situation. 
And we can take a look at that um, through the model. But I must say, this, this has been perhaps a little disappointing. The, it's extremely hard in the CompuCell 3D framework. You can build vessels, but they don't yet look um, what we would consider to have the right kind of branching. And I think that's because this is a really complicated process. Um, the, the sprouting um, is quite difficult to control in the CompuCell 3D framework. So um, I'll come back to that in just a moment, how we think we can solve that problem uh, in terms of uh, our next phase of work. So you might say at this point that what we've done so far is somewhat of a phenomenological approach. We've recapitulated many of the things we can observe um, in, in our experimental setup. But we want to point out, of course, that the animal model is limited to studies that we can perform at different intervals. And many times, um, we must sacrifice the animal, and that's the termination of the experiment. And so we really want to know about steps that are occurring in between. We, and this iterative process of going back and forth between building parameters to the model um, has really led us to refine our experiments and to suggest causality for how, how uh, the processes may influence the behavior of the, of the tumor growth. And what we've really shown is that what's key to the process is both self-adhesion and heterotypic adhesion, that is, with the, with the host cells, and also this local tissue environment. And then our next goal is, uh, since we're, we have limited time, I'll just go on to that, is that our next goal is now to use the model to explore the drug delivery. And so we are now we're look, comparing um, a, two different classes of drugs here. Um, this, these are penetration, these are experiments to, to provide information for the model. On the left, you're looking at penetration of a fluorescent um, chemo chemotherapy drug, doxorubicin. We use this um, because it, is, it, it fluoresces green, and we can grow a small spheroid in the tissue culture dish we, with a very specially coated dishes so they don't all lie down flat. You can see we can grow pretty sizable spheroids. Uh, you're just looking at a cross-section of a fairly large 3D structure. And the nuclei in the, on the right are in white. So you can count how many cells there are. And you can see, and the important thing is that doxorubicin has pen, can penetrate all the way to the center of the spheroid um, within about three hours. And compare this on the left to a, a therapeutic antibody. And therapeutic antibodies, 120 kilodaltons, as opposed to like 300 daltons, um, over here for the small molecule that, that will even penetrate cell membranes. And so you can see that in six hours, all this green fluorescent antibody has penetrated only a layer or two into the center, and that can be uh, documented over time. So the next thing we need to think about is what vessel density is going to be in patient samples, because that's how we'd like to take it, this information into something that might be useful for a clin clinician. So <clears throat> this is how we decided to solve the, pro the sort of limitations of growing vessels in CompuCell 3D, because it really, what your endpoint is what you want. You want the model to have the appropriate vessel density, and you don't want to spend all your computer resource time growing vessels and trying to get it right. So he, we, uh, we take this um, real data here. You can, I hope you can see with the cursor where the vessels are in this very dense tumor. All those dark purple spots are the nuclei of the tumor cells. And then we can take that and use a density, uh, we can use a vessel generator that was written by the graduate student in MATLAB, so we can re recapitulate that vessel density in 3D. And so now, so we, if some of you are interested, uh, you'll be able to take a look at this. This is the CompuCell 3D platform for uh, each of the steps um, in the process. Um, the Monte Carlo steps are about one second. The voxels, the volume of one tumor cell you can see here, uh, and 180 square microns, cube, micron cubed and so forth. So if, if there's any questions, we can go back to that. Um, and so now this is just a sort of a, um, a initial simulations to, to compare the, penetra the penetrance of the 300 
Dalton cisplatin, uh, which you can see here very rapidly uni and uniformly penetrates all the cells in the tumor. And up here on the left, you can, cor left corner, you can see the, the simulation space uh, recapitulating the vessel density from, that was based upon the data from the human tumor in the mouse. And then if you compare that to the penetrance of trastuzumab from the vessels away, which has to, which is a very large molecule and it can only travel through the interstitial space and is also binding to the cells, which act as a sink as it goes. And then we also can consider in the model what happens if you bathe the tumor in the drug so it's entering from the outside of the tumor. Uh, here in, on the bottom row, um, as if the the surgeon, uh, the oncologist, had injected the drug straight into the peritoneum. And so we're now on to our next phase, which is to explore this drug penetrance uh, when we look at real patient samples. The, this happens to be three different patient samples stained here. This, these are, this is immunohistochemistry for human CD31, that's the endothelial cells that are um, comprise the vessels. You can see these three different samples have quite a different morphology and a different density of uh, vessels. And so we can, using the MATLAB um, vessel generator, we can now take each one of these densities and try to see if there's a significant difference in drug penitence, particularly for the therapeutic antibodies, um, if the vessel density and architecture of the tumor is really different. Um, so, and so this phase of work, I'll admit, this phase of the work took us a little bit longer than we thought it would take because we encountered so many interesting problems along the way in this, uh, and the fact that we actually need to account for different uh, cell morphology at different sites, tumor morphology at different sites. But we, um, we really have our, in, as our next goal, predicting the range of drug delivery based on patient statistics. We think that might be useful in a clinical setting. Um, we also are interested in, um, in incorporating the other half of my lab, which is um, cell signaling, which will influence the, the behavior of the, of the tumor cells. We have another arm of the lab that's working on uh, growth factor receptor um, proliferation and migration in this setting, and so we hope to build that in. Um, and here's the interdisciplinary team. I really want to thank, uh, this is Kim Canigal, who's, who's a graduate student who's been working on this. Yi Jiang, who's at Georgia State now, had moved from Los Alamos National Lab and the clinical partner. And the other folks who've, um, uh, uh, who have worked on the, the uh, tumor model itself. And I invite you to, I, I have, um, I'm now the director of the New Mexico Systems Biology Center. And I'd like to, you know, invite you to take a look at our website to see the other things that the um, that our our experimental mathematical modeling teams do here. Um, so we have a lot of um, a lot of different projects going on, a lot of spatial stochastic modeling, uh, rules based modeling um, that we're engaged in at the center. And I'll take some questions. Thanks very much, Richard. Very nice. Uh, I'd just like to ask if. Um, you envision this becoming a individualized uh, sort of model where each patient or a different cancer with its own different genetics would require a different model or, or will one size fit all? I, I think I, I would imagine it might be more like uh, it could be individualized but my experience from working with clinicians so my clinical partners is that we need to make it as easy as possible for them to be able to 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 use the information. I th I I think, for instance, if this vessel density is something that could easily be done on any kind of tumor um, excised from a patient, so this is something that on paraffin samples from from any patient you could get that. Maybe you might have a lookup table. Maybe you might have some, you know something that might be simpler. Um, we're still evolving this because, you know, when, once you start one of these projects, it, it, sort of, it sort of outgrows its original ideas. Um, I, thoughts are, would be, I, we'd love some thoughts about this um, from the group. 
Yeah, I mean, we've been thinking about this in, in a variety of settings that uh, each patient is different from every other and this kind of issue of the personalized or precision medicine, which, is, uh, which came up in the meeting last year as well. One of, one of the things that we um, are also considering is that these, I'm very interested in this class of antibodies that um, people, individuals with lung cancer, breast cancer, all, this use of therapeutic antibodies is, it's a huge, uh, it's, it's hugely applied in medicine without a really good understanding of what happens later. And the other thing that you that the cellular POTS model may be very helpful to us is that it can also, we can now begin to build in different cell types. So what happens when cells are, when t tumor cells are targeted with therapeutic antibodies is they cause immune cells to come in. So now we can start thinking about other cells that are maybe can be induced to migrate in. Um, and so we're taking that kind of data right now. Um, we are mixing macrophages with spheroids in um, vitro and watching whether they can sort of gobble from the edges. And those are kind of things that we can maybe predict. Um, and, and do they require factors to allow them to invade? And, to, and I think one of the things you really want to know from the modeling, it seems to me like what it would be nice to know the sequence of drugs. So should you be giving, you know, should, what, what would be the optimal time frame if you really want to recruit in another cell? Um, you have to think about the lifetime of the drugs that are bound to the cells, the, the time frame of other cells to move into the tumor, and then you might be able to use that information to, to say, okay, the next drug treatment should be three days later. Something like that. Uh, that's that's hard to think about. Right. Great. Uh, I probably took too much time with my questions. Maybe we should move on to the next talk as well. Uh, running a little late. Unless oh, sorry. anybody else has a pressing question. I have a question. Yep. Um, I, I assume you've looked at the commentary that Fossbaum had uh, recently in uh, Plus One on Sailor Putts. If you had a chance to look at that and reflect on it, I have not. Um, I'll send you a link. I, I mean, I, 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 no, I have not. I mean, I have sort of my own feelings about what the strengths are of it and what the deficiencies are um, of, it, of it. Would you like to comment in particular? Oh, uh, Osbaum wrote a, uh, a piece on multi-scale modeling and morphogenesis. From the from the perspective of using cellular POTS models and analyze the pluses and minuses, and I think you'll find it useful to go through that. So I'll send you the link. Okay, that's great. Uh, maybe if you can send me the link, I'll post it on our uh, under the talk on the web page so everyone can take a look. I'll send it to Bridget also, of course. Okay. okay. Thanks. All right.